Yeah, that same reaction. And it's like, of course, the of course the real estate industry is invested in uh, filling up office buildings with people. And and so um, I that is something that I'm going to be writing about um, uh, for the Rockefeller Institute. That's kind of going to be my next area of focus in the whole work from home studying uh, thing that I'm doing for them. And then undoubtedly that will spill out into some of my other journalism writings, but just exploring what the heck is going to go on with down, downtown and suburban real estate and really anywhere where people work, period, and other than can, out, can out of you, your house. <laughs> yeah. Can you just give us a little spoiler alert? Like what are you noticing in this space? Well, um, <clears throat> so I definitely think with, with downtown real estate, um, a lot of people have tried to make comparisons to what happened to New York City after 9-11 and thinking this is just a phase, it will come back. Um, and I think that that is not going to be the case this time. I think with downtown real estate, you're going to see a zoning upheaval of, and hopefully a creative one. Uh, and that, that I'll stop there. <laughs> That's perfect. Good setup. I love how you sort of breadcrumbed it. Like, stay tuned for more. Yeah. All right, Mr. <laughs> Nick Kittle, welcome to the show. Well, we're calling it a show. It's that makes it sound so so performative. Welcome to the conversation, Nick. Um, hey, Nick Kittle is a person who has become kind of my go-to. He per, he. Not all speakers can do great on the platform and do great in an, in an environment like this. You've probably seen it yourself. You've been at a webinar where you're like, oh my God, I, this could be a podcast. There's no reason I need to be here to watch this. Nick is not one of those people. So I have mad respect for Nick's skills as a communicator, but beyond that, he is one of those people who is not afraid to kick a hornet's nest if it means it's going to benefit the common good. So I have heard this guy go toe to toe with people in local government about that innovation shouldn't cost a thing. Innovation is actually a money saver, or maybe you should invest in innovation and you're still going to save money. Um, he knows it because he's done it. He's an award winning change agent who cut his teeth in this innovation game in local government. And then recently he was awarded right next to Peter Drucker. I don't know what award this was, Nick. I can't remember. I just remember I high-fived you on LinkedIn. But Nick got listed as like one of the most important people in local government in the world. I don't know, Drucker was on the list with you. So this is a, a relatively young man as I get older. He's a relatively young man who's making a big impact. Um, Nick, same question to you as I gave to Liz. What is one signal you're noticing right now that's making you cock your head to the side like a dog hearing a harmonica for the first time? <laughs> I like dog hearing a harmonica. For, you're rolling today, Rebecca. I like the level of coffee that you're rolling with. I just want to say that. So um, a part of me just wanted to tamp it down for a second and just stare directly on the screen be like, thank you, everybody. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, you know, for me, the thing that I'm seeing, I think, that is, is the awareness, finally, that internet access is an equity issue. And I think that's a really interesting thing that hasn't come up on this level. And now it's starting to get talked about. And so I think this, what's really important to me is the conversation related to internet access being an equity issue and being critically important right now. Um, it's funny how we've gotten this far into the pandemic and that conversation is just now really starting to crest. And I totally agree with where Liz is at. This conversation about real estate needs to get real. Um, it is incredibly different how we're gonna deal with it going forward and that's not even just office space but storage space if you've had a building that's had all of you know operating at full capacity what are you going to do with all the stuff that's been stored in there as you try and figure out social distancing so it's it's like a multifaceted level on the commercial you know the operational you know so, so i think internet access is probably the one that i'm scratching my head like how did we not figure this out before um, yeah right on and you gave us the, like the first insanely tweetable tweet the real estate issue we need to get real um, thank you, sir. So we're going to talk more about, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about the, um, the equity issue around uh, telecom and internet, hi-fi, and all that. So here's what I did, you guys. I prepared three questions for our panelists and me to talk about. We're going to talk about it together. So I've kind of got this player coach role here where I got to both guide the conversation and I want to be in the conversation with them. And then at about the bottom of the hour, give or take, um, Yaz will pull the chain or give us the hook. Uh, we're going to we're gonna stop our kvetching and we're going to turn it over to you um, and start taking your questions. So y'all, first question. This is straight out of Liz's email to me. She said, the pandemic sped up a lot of innovation that local government was slow to adopt, telecommuting, automation, virtual, and AI. But here's my question, right? Is local government best delivered in person? 
What of these innovations can stick? Who wants to start? I think it depends on the local government service. Um, who here has waited in a long, long line at the DMV for something that could have been done online? I think all of us have. And yeah, <laughs> um, and you know, uh, it, it, permitting things. I mean, there's so many like just of the actual paperwork type stuff that can be done online or through an app or you know just that kind of thing where you don't where you have we don't get transferred from operator to someone else in the department to someone else in the department and all of that stuff um, you know we can make that so much more seamless and governments have been in the process of doing that for sure I mean we all have, I mean I think most of us have DMV kiosks and that kind of thing now just to stick with that example um, but but I think what um, what so a lot of this stuff that we're seeing kind of fast tracked as far as the automation and service delivery, I, I think that should and will stay for the most part. But what that frees up local government to do is what local governments care really care about doing, uh, you know, interacting with people face to face for the things that matter, showing up at your doorstep to doorstep to uh, you know answer the questions, um, to fill the potholes. I mean, to do the actual physical three dimensional things that people who, most people who sign up to work in local governments want to do, cleaning up the parks, all of that stuff that makes us feel good on the inside and not the paper cuts. Right on. Okay, Nick, what do you have to add to that? You know, I think I'm going to take a slightly different viewpoint on that and say that, yes, I do think that the move to online services is going to continue and that's fine. But the real challenge for local governments is that, you know, government it, corruption is the number one fear in America for five years in a row, according to Chapman University, right? And so, as you think of local governments being this scary place for most people, how do you create positive interaction points with the community? So as we move more online, we reduce the positive, we reduce the interaction opportunities that local governments have with the people they serve. So how do you displace or replace that with positive interaction points to what Liz was saying, um, which is to say, where are those positive touch points that we can engage? Because that's how you build and mend the relationship that allows for the trust um, to be there for us to be able to provide that. And until internet, access and broadband, you know, until we deal with that issue, online service delivery is still an equity issue. Um, and, and so there's still that, that part at play too. So we have to deal with, if we're going to move online, we have to deal with the internet equity issue as well in that. Um, so I'd say, what are we going to, what are we going to intentionally offer in person because it's the right thing to do and it creates those positive interaction points with the community. All right, you guys, good. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to bring it home with one additional thing that I hope sticks. And that is, um, and I've, I've ranted about this long before the pandemic, but now we've actually seen that it's real. I can't tell you how many times um, I've been asked like to come and talk to a local government. I'm like, oh, I'm out of town that night. I won't be in town for Monday or Tuesday night, but I could do this remotely. I could teleconference it. No, that's not allowed. This notion that in order to participate in local government, you have to show up at the city chambers on the night at the time is bullshit. And it's been bullshit for a long time. And it really prevents us from bringing in, I, I exclude myself from this, but really bringing in subject matter experts who could help shape a debate. So this notion of like, how can we decouple what happens in council chambers from council chambers? It is possible in these discrete cases to have some of the best even local people participate. And then if you kick that domino over just one more, you know what else it allows? It allows people who really care about their cities, but who have to um, be working away from home, um, it allows them to serve in local government. Because again, you know, you often hear people say like, I've lived in this community my whole life, that's why I should be on local government. I don't think that should be the sole qualification. I actually want you to have left. I want you to have gotten some experience other places. Stop sipping your own tea, right? But I do wanna say uh, one thing about corruption, Nick, and one thing about seeing local government at work, which you both touched on. A couple of weeks ago, I, I saw, um, I think it's Pointer. They've listed all the local media sources that have either you know, said, we're done, we're out, or who have merged with one of the bigger players. And there is a correlation between when you lose your local media source and corruption going up. So A, it should be a feather in, in Liz's cap to continue to do really good journalism. <laughs> but B, um, it should give all of us a reason to think about why we support local media. Because when there is a watchdog keeping track 
of how this works, there's a chance we can we can moderate um, we can moderate this corruption. And this goes all the way to the point where um, local governments that do not have local newspapers tend to have lower bond ratings because it's one of the things that the bond agencies look for. So Nick, put that in your stack next time you, you visit with folks about that. And then the final thing you said about seeing local government at work, I, I read this clear back in the beginning of the pandemic, like when I think somebody was making the argument about why we needed to keep doing park and rec programming was because we needed our residents to see that we were out there taking care of kids, helping people be healthy, you know, these physical signals that your local government is working for you. And that is a strong argument to make that not everything can be, can be done remotely. Do you, does anybody want to pile onto that? I certainly don't want to try to have the last word. I, I want to add in something about the about the trust and broadband issue. Um, I live in an area with um, sketchy internet service, as Rebecca and Nick know. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, you know, like the broadband access, especially when it comes to distance learning, has been a real issue here. Um, we have had, uh, I have felt like our school district has been working very hard at um, doing what they can, but we have people just without internet access or without reliable internet internet access and um, and I think it cuts you know kind of goes both ways um, I think uh, some I was chit chatting with somebody uh, yesterday with my mask on uh, after getting my oil change and I personally have had a good experience with my school and what my son's experience was and will be with distant learning so far he's he's in a different school has a has an old, older daughter and he felt like it was a completely different experience. And he also, I'm making an assumption here, but I think he's coming from a place of just not trusting that government's gonna do right by him anyway. Um, and I come from kind of the opposite end of the spectrum. So, so much of it depends on your own personal experience and where you're coming from too with that. But I'm with you on the whole broadband access issue as well, that it is truly an, an equity issue. Nick, do you have any more you want to say on this Q1? I don't. Roger, <laughs> roger that. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about the anatomy of innovation. Um, <laughs> we have to be together to innovate. We have to be together. True, false, something in the middle, why? Nick, let's come to you first. I know I you've got, got rant, rant pants. Rant I got a rant first on this one, Rebecca. No, you do not need to be in the same room to innovate. You know, like, let's get it together here, people. Um, so keeping it real for a second, people are terrible at being creative. You're not creative. Good chance that's the case. 95% um, of adults are not creative. At the age of five, 95% of us are creative geniuses. So NASA ran a, a, tempor a temporal study over a course of time where they reviewed people as they grew up over the course of their lifetimes. And at five years old, 95% of us are creative geniuses. By the time we reach adulthood, so those same people, less than 5% of us are creative. So we don't even know what we're doing for the most part. Kids have us beat in this department by a long shot. And guess what they know how to do? They do what's called divergent thinking. So their thing is I can be completely by myself and be my own creative source of everything because I'm not constrained by the roles of society and how we have to think. So kids have it right because they do what's called divergent thinking. Over the course of our lives, we're taught what's called, called convergent thinking. We learn the paradigms, we learn the norms, we learn what acceptable thinking looks like. And so we lose our ability to be creative and it's trained out of us over time, right? Between our teachers, between our parents, uh, you know, because when your kids ask you why, at a certain point you answer because I said so. And who's got the answers when you grow up? Your teachers do. And then who has the answer? Your boss. I'm just kidding. Your boss never actually had the answer. Just kidding. Um, but you know, that's the thing though. So when we think about this part of like, I have to be in the same room to be creative. No, in fact, it's better that you are not in the same room to start with because our creative processes, if any of you have ever been an artist or know this, happen when they happen. In the shower, taking a run, you know, whatever your gardening, whatever your thing is, it's unique to you and it's a personal experience. So the concept of brainstorming is just dumbing ourselves down so that we can feel socially accepted. And if we don't start from a place of divergent thinking, we know that we're gonna end up with bad answers because we're not good at being creative. So how about that for a dose of reality for a hot second? So no, Woo! let's not be in the same room. Let's not be in the same room to start with. And guess what? When we get in the same room, 
all the better because we've got these really different places to start from and that's how we get to true creative innovative ideas rant over i love it hashtag rant over liz farmer what do you say <laughs> um i don't have a whole i definitely don't have a pre pre-prepared rant um and not a ton to add on this um because i think nick has a lot more of has done a lot more of the thinking on this but i will say that um, I do think we're at an inflection point as far as as what the overarching approach has been to um, to interacting with each other virtually. Um, you know, I mean, Rebecca, you mentioned it in the beginning about how company, you know, IBM famously had had, had encouraged uh, remote work for a long time and then dialed it way back a couple of years ago, saying that innovation just isn't happening. But I think what we're seeing now is. What the, what the pandemic has done is we have fast forwarded at least five years in the course of like three or four months. And, um, and we have been forced to adopt, you know, for better or worse, ways of interacting with each other that probably would have happened five, six, seven, eight years from now on the regular. And now we're doing it all the time. So we're just like guzzling this stuff down and we're not gonna suddenly snap back to what we were before. So I think we are being forced to learn a new way to be creative and real and interact with each other. And, and that is gonna lead to more spontaneity even though we're you know thousands of miles apart while interacting. You know, what occurs to me as, as we're all talking about this is, I mean, Nick, the fact that what you just told us about divergent and convergent thinking was probably new to many people on this call. It raises to me the issue that we haven't thought much about how we think. We don't have a shared lexicon of understanding how innovation even happens how good ideas really, yes, there have been a few best-selling books about it, but how many of us make it our practice to push ourselves to the edge of our thinking? I mean, I've been very inspired by Cal Newport's work on deep work, you know, and that that is a muscle that you have to continue to like put your reps in. Um, but we don't make time for deep work. Half the people on this call already had to go to another call. Uh, not to say that this is the most important thing they're doing, right? But, and it's an exaggeration because we still have 103 people on the call. But the idea here is that we haven't, as human beings, as workers, um, as servants of local government, really thought about how good innovation happens. And then when, when we, so we haven't thought about how it happens. We don't know how to engineer it. And then what ends up happening, uh, you know, this week, uh, Dorothy Walker, the foundress of the American Planning Association, published this great article about if we want greater equity in our cities, we actually have to do planning fundamentally differently. And just the way we've been planning our communities, land use planning is, you know, the planners come up with some ideas, they have to shred it to what ends up often being the same group of 50 Patagonia fleece wearing busybodies in the community who without fail don't want anything but single family homes. Um, and it, the, no matter how much time and effort goes into it, they have to just scrap it at the end of the day. So I, I really feel like what's happening here is we have a fundamental, it's not even a misunderstanding, it's a lack of understanding of what innovation actually is how to best orchestrate it individually and in teams, because as many people have said in the chat, and Nick, I know you feel this is the same way, but when the collaboration happens, you do that together, you pilot things together. But we have to be able to pull apart what is truly location-based, co-location-based, what is individually based, what is the anatomy of innovation? And maybe Nick, can you take one more crack at that? Um, step up to the plate, like how does innovation actually freaking happen? Yeah, sure. So like, let, let me address something you said there, which is really important because there's two phases to it, right? It's about creativity being implemented and you have to do both in order for it to be successful. And when you get to the implementation phase, the challenge of this remote work is that it does impact our ability to effectively pilot projects. If I don't have regular relationships and I don't interact with you on a personal regular basis every single day, I am going to have a harder time when it gets to the implementation being successful at getting something off the ground. So let's recognize that that is a, a, a definite fail point for this remote work environment that we're in. Now, when it comes to the creativity side, it's definitely there. So one of, the, one of the tools that I help people understand is this concept of falsifying trauma and the trick that our brain plays on us. 
Um, and so when I talk about falsifying trauma, it's doing things intentionally every single day to put yourself in a place of discomfort because that provides you with the mental resiliency and the understanding about how to adapt for those things. Our ability to change our own lens, our perspective, is fundamentally how we get creative. And so um, do something silly and ridiculous. Write a poem at midnight. Lay down on the ground and stare at the ceiling for two minutes. By the way, when you do this in the workplace, people think you're insane, and that's okay because I am. But at the same time, I'm wildly creative. So that's part of it. Right? Is I'm not com I'm very comfortable looking like a fool as I have most of my life. This is where that space has really come in handy. So do the things you're really uncomfortable. Eat ice cream for breakfast. You know what I mean? Like take a yeah, right on. Stuart's loving that. You know, take a take a different way home from work intentionally so that you notice the things you would never notice otherwise. Because what happens is our brain gets into a pattern. We get really comfortable with the river of our experience, which tells us that the things we're doing are correct. And the fact is, when we get thrown something that throws us for a loop, we are completely inca incapacitated and unable to handle that. So that's why it's so important that we get in this mindset of creativity, especially with falsifying trauma. And you've seen this as people have gone through the pandemic. Some have adjusted incredibly well, some have not. The river of their experience held them back from being able to make those adjustments, right? So that's the part we've got to get into the space of. So do something today that will make you deeply uncomfortable for a hot second. And as you learn to do that, you will become better and better at freeing your mind up and allow those creative waves to connect. Um, so that's my, that's my creative short sell for you. And if you're looking for more, happy to talk with you about that, right? Yeah, right on. So Nick, throw your email in the chat right now. And then the other thing I would ask everybody to do is, um, could you reflect in the chat what is the last thing you did to intentionally make yourself uncomfortable? Because um, I think I would love to read this and be inspired by it. Um, Nick doesn't need more ideas. But all of it does remind me of, there's this sign in my birth mom's house. Um, and, you know, some of you know, I only met her like eight years ago. And it's been, it's been amazing to meet this person who looks like you. But there's this sign in her house that says, don't grow up, it's a trick. Um, and so Nick has obviously followed that to the letter of the law. All right, um, before we go to, to take about four more minutes here, you guys, Q3. Um, Liz, let's start with you on this one. <laughs> let's say that the three of us, oh, I'm drunk on power right now. Let's say that the three of us were the city council for all cities in America, okay? Um, what would we, what long bets, this is the key, long bets would we make now because we can clearly see their payoff? Liz? Municipal broadband, city owned public broadband. Uh, some governments have do done it, uh, probably most famously Chattanooga, but uh, it has been, you know, there are legal issues, blah, 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 blah. But the point is, is that you can have a publicly operated and, uh, uh, you know, business, government business entity that doesn't cost nearly as much as private companies and provide service to everybody. That's my plug. Yeah, right on. All right, Kittle, what you got? I think it's land use planning. Uh, you, you know, like that would be the first thing I tackle is how we look at this. Um, you know, yeah, there's so many different things in the land use planning equation. You know, like I think we build parking structures because we've always built parking structures, but do you think cars are the primary form of transportation 50 years from now? I mean, do you think that's how it's gonna work? How are you dealing with drones, right? I was working with a community in Iowa that had seven times the number of parking spaces as they do people. They were, had a operating shortfall of over $100 million a year and they had 2.1 billion wrapped up in parking assets you know, come on, right? Like, but they did what they were doing before because parking and cars or how we do, right? Like scrap that nonsense or whatever. And let's rethink how we do our land use planning in general, because um, for every single city council in America, I'll say this to you, land isn't going out of style. So quit giving it away like it is, right? Like it, it's, it's funny how much we let those Patagonia wearing 50 people influence the way that our entire, you know, country grows. Um, when in reality, let's hold on to that land, let's make sure that there are rules and that we plan it properly and that we're addressing the future and not just being beholden to the past because it's comfortable that way. Woo! This group is on fire! Fire um, today, We're fiery today. Boom! I love it. Okay, here's what I would do. And honest to God, you guys, I didn't think about my answer to this question. I don't know how this one slipped off, but this is what I would do. Um, I would require 
that every major decision that future councils make, um, and we could define what major is, like it's more than a $10 million investment or a $5 million investment, we could scale it to the size of the community. Um, or if it was gonna be something we were gonna have to live with beyond 10 years, I would re require that it had something like a seventh generation consideration. That the question had to be asked, what is our best guess about whether this will advantage or disadvantage our children's children's great, great, great grandchildren. So that we took a little bit more long-termism to making short-term decisions. So we weren't just politically expedient. Okay, um, yes? We'll go, no, Nick, go ahead. Yaz will start um, collecting, some, collecting some ideas here. I'm going to tag on to that, Rebecca, because, you know, New Zealand does some interesting things when it comes to public works that speak to what you're talking about. It is illegal in New Zealand for them to pass on debt to future generations as it relates to any infrastructure. That is the exact type of thinking we need to be engaged in, right? So there is no debt going forward on that, and you have to find a way to pay. So they do a lot of things differently, obviously, than we do, but that's that seventh generation thinking. At least they're thinking one or two generations ahead of not handing off massive amounts of debt, right? Others have done it. We can do it too. Sweet. Liz, do you need to get in on that as well or get in on anything that Nick, Nick said? I, I, yeah, you could, could you see my face? <laughs> yeah, I did. I was like, I think she's got something to say. I was like, oh. um, so that is interesting. I'd forgotten that about New Zealand. And, um, you know, while I'm not like a, hey, let's let everyone be like, sorry if anyone here is from Chicago. Um, but hey, let's everyone be like Chicago. I'm not, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, it's going to graduate school there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so not, not in favor of that much debt, but it, there is a lot of, uh, a lot to be said for, you know, much like we get mortgages on our houses, like paying stuff off over time, not saddling uh, the current generation with something that future generations will be enjoying as well. Awesome, okay, Yaz, um, you have a big darn job because these folks have lit this chat up like nobody's business, but I'm willing to bet that there is um, a person or two on there who might be familiar to you that you, <laughs> either that you trust to like take themselves off mute or there's a really clear question. Where do you want to take us? What's a question you'd like to pose to the panel based on the chat, Yaz? Oh, good question. Um, okay. First, I wanna start off with a comment about when we were uh, talking about creativity, right? Um, folks are talking about, for example, the, the problem solving opportunities that come about now because of uneven access to internet. There are creative solutions out there like putting hotspots on school buses and driving them. I, I think I saw something about that. Um, was it Lynn, Lynn Penke? Did you, you wanna describe a little bit how creative, uh, where am I? Where yeah, Lynn, Lynn Penke, I think I saw that too in the chat that there's some- Could have uh, been me, which one? I've been in, in conversation with Katie Simon Holland, my new best friend. <laughs> yeah, um, and I don't have a lot of details because I looked away from this. Yeah, um, so we're, we're really struggling with the digital divide and the connectivity. And so all of our 42 libraries in Hennepin County, many of which are currently closed, we've put hotspot Wi-Fi extenders in the parking lot so that people can at least Lynn, you accidentally hit your mute, but uh, we got it. We got the gist of it. We got the gist of it. Um, I've seen this also in Henderson, Nevada. They're starting to really think about how they can use their community rooms that are already wired and set up socially distant um, spacing so that kids who don't have access to Wi-Fi can come do homework, safe space, you know, do some, do some learning and get connected to the interwebs. Um, yes, wh what else? What other questions? I'm seeing Stuart Sandstrom. I think you asked something about dissolving. Um, can you elaborate, please? Well, you you can hear me? Yes. Okay, so you said, what's the long-term thing that you as a local city council could do? How about quit? There, there, there's more local units, any, not just local units of government, there's just more units of government anywhere. So, you know, be a good example. We don't need 25, police chiefs in a town of 200,000, right? That's, that was my point. 
I love it. That's good and provocative. And Nick and Liz, let's talk a little bit about that because um, I know that <laughs> I remember the very first first Friday we did. We got a call. We got a question from an assistant city manager in um, a city in California, a friend of mine actually. And I remember her asking Mark Funkhauser. Nick was on that call, and she asked Mark, "Should we go into like emergency debt management mode or something?" This was like on March seventeenth or something. I mean, it was crazy. It was so early, and Mark was like, "Not only should you do that, you should possibly declare bankruptcy if your state will allow it." And you know, and on and on and on he went. And I thought, "Oh Lord, um, here we go." So, but to, but now, as Stuart says. What is the point of having so many different units of local government? And some states and commonwealths have far more than others. This is not a one size fits all, but Nick or Liz, what are you seeing? Liz, you're already off mute. Why don't you start? Yeah, I, I mean, I don't foresee us having a wave of bankruptcies actually this time uh, compared with the, if you can call what happened in the last recession a wave, I mean, you know, way more than we've ever seen before. Um, there are a lot of, uh, John Oliver actually has this great episode on special district governments. If, if you are at all a John Oliver fan, it is funny and informative and very, very true. Um, there are a ton that of put special, it in the chat. Thank you. <laughs> yes, there are a ton of special districts. Um, and, and most of them are run by two or three people and usually men and nobody has any input because there's a hundred bazillion of them and they actually you know water districts that sort of thing um and so thank you i saw that in the chat it's up everyone um and, and so yeah there, there are a lot of districts and we don't need that many I, I wouldn't go far as to say city councils and other kind of larger levels of government um but yeah um but yeah just to to counteract what mark said because obviously i know him very well um you know i i wouldn't i wouldn't foresee a whole wave of bankruptcies like this time around but you you might see some of the smaller smaller uh, districts uh kind of fold or get taken over by other levels nick what are you seeing you know i, I think this is an area where government isn't good in general we're good at creating things not good at dissolving things so in general we'll, we'll build something and then let it you know, operate its clunky self into oblivion for the rest of life, you know, all time and not ever dissolve. So I think, you know, the comment that Stuart's bringing up about dissolving or consolidating or looking at that is a reasonable one. And that's why you do public private partnerships and manage competition and these kinds of things in local governments. It happens, you know, but it's, it's also a response to localized tribalism, right? And tribal, you know, sort of this tribal belief of our community versus the community next to us. And, you know, in Colorado Springs, it's this big, right? But then there's this Manitou pocket of, you know, hyper liberal people surrounded by this, you know, conservative bastion. So it's like they want to live in Manitou and have an identity as Manitou, whereas if they were consolidated in Colorado Springs, people wouldn't want to live there. So I think there's that element of tribalism that comes that dictates some of that. Um, but at the same time, if it's all on the table, put it all on the table and have a real conversation about is this working for us anymore? And, and let's Dr. Phil, right? How's that working for you? And in many cases, it, it's not. You know, so let's get, you know, let's have that conversation. I, I like it as a point. It's an interesting one. My Which, afternoon is complete. We have now had a Dr. Phil reference. Oh, yeah. Yes, what do you have for another question? I got two questions here. Uh, one from Karen Mills, which is what's going to happen to airports? Ooh. And <laughs> second question okay. is from Donna Cox, how do we convince local small governments to merge certain areas, such as parks management? Yeah, that is such a great question because you know you even think about in your own neighborhood, we all have lawnmowers in our garages. This seems ridiculous, right? So when Oakland or other communities, like I know there are communities in the Twin Cities, they do the tool sharing, right? Or the you know, the, the sharing services where you can check it out through Nextdoor or some other um, local app, that at the neighborhood level is something that we might be able to do a little bit more effectively at the municipal level, not have 17 maintenance sheds for 17 different units of local government, um, but have, you know, three or four maintenance sheds um, and run some operational efficiencies that way. I mean, I can certainly make the budget argument for it, but Liz Farmer knows budgets way more than I do. And Nick, you've been inside these organizations when they've done innovative things. So what do you guys have to say? 
Well, I'll jump on that Parks one for a second and say that, you know, I think the managed competition is a huge piece of this and we in government shouldn't be afraid of that. It's also a dirty word, but we did manage competition. And I think that the concept of a comparative advantage is really important. It's talked about a lot in business, but in government, we don't talk about that. And certain municipalities are just better equipped, better, you know, are, are better um, able to go ahead and deliver high quality value services to those. You know, I noticed we got Brent, you know, Stockwell on the line from Scottsdale, you know, their ability to do service delivery because they're this award winning community, you know, can they offer those services to others? Now that may not be where we want to live at, but we need to start tracking the data to be able to say, yes, we are delivering service at a value um, that's appropriate. And here are comparative points to point that out. You can't really do the merging beyond the political nonsense. You can't do the merging without knowing who's actually offering the service well. And I don't think that most communities can even address whether they're offering the service well because they lack the data. Um, what is managed competition? I have never heard that until today. So it's it's the you know it's it's called outsourcing in the dirtiest oh, work, but the but the idea is we send it out the door. But managed competition is that internal services compete with external services or services provided by another community. So oh, got it. we can do an intentional process where you can win your job and make sure that it stays there. So for example, we did a ten year cycle. Um, you would compete every ten years on whatever it is with the private sector and with other entities in the region to demonstrate that you were doing it. If you were within 10% of the budget, right, then you kept it, done deal, because there's switching costs, right, that, that are huge in some cases. If not, then maybe if you have a zero to five, you would go through a process of more rigorous competition to determine, is this an apples to apples comparison? And in some cases, like street sweeping, it was so clear that that should be done by the private sector, you send it out the door. So it's not you send everything out the door, outsources, yellow pages, libertarianism. It is, we're going to engage in business practice competition, and that's managed competition. Aye, aye. Liz, what do you think? I, I have a question for Nick, actually. <laughs> How do you get around the union aspect uh, of all that and contract labor? Yeah, you issues? don't have them. That was how we did it there. We just didn't have them. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah. It, there is no getting around it. Yeah, you, you don't is the answer to that, Liz, but that was, that was it. Um, but bankruptcy, right, gets you out of that in the con in the union space, right? So to Stuart's point earlier of, hey, if we're getting into bankruptcies, is that an advantage and an opportunity for you to restructure how you're thinking about this? Because now the rules don't apply anymore. But yeah, we didn't have unions like that. that. Yeah, that's very true. I was thinking about that when you're talking and also with the with that, that question too, because both San Bernardino's bankruptcy and Stockton's bankruptcy involved uh, outsource, you know, doing shared services with the surrounding county. I think in both cases it was fire and EMS, I could be wrong. Um, and so, yeah, but it's, it's just striking to me that you have to get to that really, really desperate, ugly, horrible level uh, to, the, to do something that ultimately saves money. I mean, I know uh, there are some examples in the Midwest where they're doing it a little bit more often. I want to say it's, I can't remember which state, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, but um, yeah. So, and the, the airports question too, um, I feel like I, honestly, my knee jerk reaction to what's going to happen to airports is uh, the same thing that's going to happen to public transit agencies and, and leave it at that. <laughs> but, you know, I don't, I'm not sure anybody really knows, but I did notice. So a couple of things. One, I think municipal airports are the ones I'm really afraid for. Um, the larger ones, I did read this really interesting story about this like explosion of innovation in terms of getting people through airports quickly, touching as few things as possible. Um, all this crazy AI big brother type stuff that maybe wouldn't have flown last year, but now there's a lot of pilot testing going on in major airports with this stuff. So who knows? I, mean, I think long term people still need to get places and we all want to go on vacation. So I don't see the major airports, you know, folding but I'm not sure anyone has anything more secure than that to say. <laughs> the one thing I will say is that in talking about airports, Lynn talked, uh, Liz talked about pilot projects. That's hilarious. And also she said stuff that wouldn't have flown last year is can now fly. So uh, she, you can't stop a journalist from just being punning it up. You just can't stop. You just can't not stop. even on purpose. <laughs> I know. That's what I mean. It's like second nature for you, you writer, literate person. Um, oh, jeez. You know, I don't have a feeling about what's going to happen um, to airports. What I what I think like a leading indicator of how airports will go is how well airlines respond. And from what I can tell at this point, 
Delta is the only airline that is really taking this coronavirus, like serious, like serious as a heart attack. Um, you know, doing the temperature testing, requiring masks. They are the only airline, I, I believe, that at this point is fumigating all of the planes between, um, between flights. And that is, the, the scientists say that is the best way to like detox these planes, to devirus these planes. And so if you think about, is Delta creating sort of like a new world order? Then you have to think about Atlanta Hartsfield and you have to think about the Twin Cities, uh, the two of the Delta, the big Delta hubs um, in the United States. So it's, um, I don't have more to say about municipals than that, but I do think that these, um, these airlines can drive a lot of what ends up happening uh, because at the end of the day for people, this is about feeling safe. This is about a feeling of safety. Um, so, I would, I guess I'd leave it there. Yes, do we have one more question before we take our, our esteemed panelists into the plug zone? Uh, yes, there is a question from Ashley Kramer. Ashley, can you take yourself off mute and ask your question? If you recall, it was something about CPS. I'm not sure what CPS is. I'm Steph, or, well, that's Steph, <laughs> I'm, Steph. I'm Ashley. <laughs> Steph has oh, a little bit more so because she is a school counselor. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so I guess the question just based off of the idea of CPS, Child Protective Services, how moving into this world of a digital age, especially with this spring in, in distance learning, like not being able to connect with some families and, and, and being worried about how to support, how do we connect with governments still and how does government still do what they need to do to keep our kids safe? Let's, um, this is a great question. And I want, I know that, the, I know that there are a lot of people in this room today who are, work for counties and have to work with CPS and states. So let's light up the chat, you guys. If you have some cool shit that you're doing, get it in the chat. Let's inspire each other here. But Liz and Nick, are you guys interfacing or what are you noticing on the CPS front? I don't think there's any easy answers to what you're asking about. I mean, really, the truth is, is that that's a really in-person, you know, you have to have the touch points on an in-person level, right? So it is going to be a redevelopment of how that works and hopefully not a recovery because let's face it, it could be done better, right? Um, and so I think the opportunity is there to reinvent it. But, you know, just like with domestic violence, you know, we're seeing the massive upticks. How do you deal with those things that are so social and so personal in an environment that's been depersonalized? And I don't know that there are really good answers on that that I, that I have, but I'll say that I, I have the same kind of fears that you do. Um, how, how, do you, how do you get into people's homes when they may not even have internet access and in many cases aren't even going to have that, let alone being able to portray something that's untrue that somebody in person would be able to know? And decreased touch points with teachers who are usually those first alarm bells it is not happening either, right? So now you've really removed kids from an environment where they have advocates available to them. Um, as scary as that might be for them. So I, I, I sympathize and empathize with the issue. I don't know a good answer on it though. That's my two cents. Liz, anything you're seeing? Um, no, but somebody, where did it go? So Katie, Simon, and it was somebody uh, has posted that our teachers have been doing front porch visits all summer. Um, there's a lot of good stuff coming up in the chat, which yes. is amazing because I'm like Nick, I'm like, this is one of those, there, there are things that, that fall through the cracks, fall through huge gaping you know, caverns, really, when we have uh, a situation such as we do now, and that is one of them. And it, again, it does boil down to equity. Uh, people who are, uh, um, you know, who are low-income households and um, who tend to be a minority are the ones who are feeling the, the, the brunt of this and getting neglected. And so um, this is encouraging to see what people are doing, and I'm going to... I definitely want to make notes on these. <laughs> we listen. We're going to harvest the chat, you guys. So um, we can harvest that and clean it up, and we will turn this into a blog blog post as well. Um, I was having a lucid dream about some of this CPS stuff, and and I, to be honest, I wasn't thinking about child protective services as an agency. I was thinking of taking care of kids generally because I was raised in a household that was very abusive, and I know that if I was one of those kids who wasn't able to get to school my life would be much more dangerous and much more violent at that age. So I've been thinking a lot, like Katie Simon Holland mentioned these front porch visits, and I've been thinking that whoever my teacher was last year, like if I'm going into the third grade this year, my second grade teacher knows me best. 
And I have the most trust with that person. That's the person I knew the best. I may or may not know the guidance counselor, but usually the teacher. And I've been thinking about the front porch visits with my last year teacher. Not my new teacher, because my new teacher doesn't know all the signals. My new teacher doesn't know me as well, but my old teacher might. And, and this to me feels like almost, I don't want to, I don't want to minimize how important education is, but I, I do feel like taking care of children's well-being is, is, is as important right now as education, because you hear so many parents say, my kid's going to be just fine, but other kids need services more than I do. And the kids who aren't safe at home, I think fall into that tranche and should be prioritized. The next set of kids that fall into the tranche, not the next set, this is a co-equal set, are kids with learning disabilities who cannot get serviced um, at home in the way that they could. And, and I just think we have to do a full, remember at the top of the hour when I said rework is it like working from home isn't like working at the office, just doing it somewhere else. That's the shakeup. That's the thinking that I think we need to think about with kids as well. We shouldn't just try to say either kids are going to be five days in school or they're not. We should be saying, wait, which kids need the most care, help, and support? It's not all kids. And many parents would say, I'd be very happy to let other resources go to kids who are getting the shit beat out of them, who are not safe at home, who are taking giant steps back uh, in their development. So I just think we need to rethink that. Okay, rant over. All right, you guys, plug zone. Nick, Liz, what are you working on? What can this all-star cast of 100 help support you? Ladies first. Liz, what you got cooking? Um, so like I mentioned, I'm just going to throw out my website and email on here to everyone, uh, who wants, who wants it. Um, and it's, but I'm working on, you know, kind of all the different aspects of COVID-19 and work from home. That is through my fellowship with the Rockefeller Institute. So I will be looking at the next, the value, I mean, what's going on with that cities, downtowns and tax revenue, sales tax revenue, property tax revenue specifically. Um, income tax revenue for places like New York City that like to tax people who work there but don't live there. So all that kind of fun stuff. Um, that's kind of the next big thing on my plate. I'm regularly writing for Forbes.com as well. Most of it is on what Congress isn't doing to help state and local governments. Um, so keep an eye out for that stuff as well. Thank you, Liz, for all that you do for state and local governments, um, you know, not just by how you think about it, but how you write about it and give us something to rally around. Nick, what about you? Plug Zone Amigo, what you got cooking? How can we support you? Well, I think if you're looking for a great book on innovation and how to build it into government in a sustainable way, check out Sustainovation. So just a straight up plug right there. Um, you know, for me, I put my, my email in the chat too. You know, right now, um, to be honest with you, I am taking a breather. I decided that I'm not pushing a noodle up a hill for a minute and being a trainer and speaker in local government, let's just say budgets have been cut. So I am taking a moment to myself. I hiked a 14er yesterday, a 14,000 foot mountain. I intend to do a couple more of those. But if you are looking for somebody to push the boundaries of innovation in your organization, help you plan, look ahead teams, have conversations about innovation in your organization, or you need somebody to be a mediator for challenging conversations, I'm available. Um, and that's what I'd say is, you know, other than that, I'm taking a breather for a second. So if you got something coming up and you want to chat, I'm all on your team. And other than that, you know, just looking forward to my next chance to work with Rebecca and Liz again, and so many other friends that are on this call. So thanks for, thanks for the opportunity. Oh man, that's awesome. All right. We're going to bring it to a big close, you guys. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to ask our audience to write one thing, one thing in the chat that they're either taking away as a big insight or something that you're gonna like do more research on because you're like, holy crap, this could be a game changer. So just one thing, we wanna know what sticks for you or what you're gonna be working on because it helps us know what worked and you know what we might help you develop, maybe bring you future uh, webinars on. So while our uh, 100 or so folks are lighting it up, Liz and Nick, back to you. What, you both will respond to this, Liz, you're gonna go first. What is one bet you're gonna make about how local government is gonna do the right thing and we're gonna emerge in a more innovative way. One bet that you're willing to make, a thousand bucks on Vegas, you put all the chips on one thing, what is it? <laughs> I don't like betting. Um, <laughs> so, I, all right, so I honestly, I could not decide, but um, 
what what I what I'm confident in is that local government is going to leap forward in terms of the flexibility it gives its own employees. And it has been sort of behind behind the curve on that. And by flexibility, I mean when and where they work. Obviously, that can't be true necessarily for like cops, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, you know, just more flexibility. Um, and what I think that, that means then is less union influence, which of course has been that's been a trend uh, long term anyway. So that's my long winded way of saying more remote work for state and local governments. They have flipped the script on that anyway. Um, you know, three times as many people are now remotely working as there was before. I don't think we're going to go all the way back. So, and, and along with that, hopefully some of the better in-person interactions that uh, we talked about earlier on in the conversation. Sweet. Nick, what about you? The quick and dirty would be that I think that the people have just learned how the way we've always done it has always been deeply unsafe and they're going to redefine risk. And I think governments now have the capacity to do that and they didn't before there was an argument to do that. And I don't think it's an argument anymore. There's a compelling reason to do things differently. It's always been deeply dangerous to have that. It's, it's now evident that it's always been deeply dangerous and we can change it. And now they have a habit forming of changing the way they do business. That's available if people choose to go ahead and light that up and move it forward. And my big bet that I think government is going to get right is um, I think that governments have finally gotten the memo about using an equity lens on land use, on planning. Um, and I think we're gonna see in the very near term, I think we're gonna see far more equity directors, people who wake up every day thinking about this. And if it's like the quality movement, remember in the 80s and 90s, we hired somebody for quality and they were the champion and got people trained and then eventually, and it was its own office and its own division. And then eventually it was the way that we ran. So I hope that it's gonna, we're gonna have this big punch through you know, into something new around equity. It's my big bet on how cities are going to use this time to do, to actually become places that work better for more people. All right, that's our show for today. Liz Farmer, Nick Kittle, Yasmin Arakan, thank you very much. And thank you. We couldn't do this without you. We love you guys. Next Friday, Yasmin and I are going to have a futurist throwdown. Yaz started her career from a different place than I did, and now we're working together with different perspectives. We're going to talk about the best tools, the worst tools, what she loves, what I hate, um, and we're going to talk about how you can imagine better futures. So it's going to be a tool and futurist smackdown next week. See you there. Bye, everybody. Bye. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>